You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network, the home of the Options Podcast. For more quality options programs, visit theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app available in the iTunes and Google Play stores. Select programs are also available via live stream at mixler.com slash options dash insider. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com slash options dash insider. Insider. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at twitter.com slash options, stocktwits.com slash options, facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the The Options Insider Radio Network is sponsored by Fidelity Investments. Fidelity's Option Trade Builder tool can help you confidently build an options trade in three simple steps. Just choose a strategy, select a contract, and then review the benefits and risks of the trade. Learn more about Option Trade Builder at fidelity.com backslash options. Options trading entails significant risk and is not appropriate for all investors. Certain complex option strategies carry additional risk. Before trading options, contact Fidelity Investments by calling 800-544-5115 to receive a copy of the characteristics and risks of standardized options. Fidelity Brokerage Services, LLC, member NYSC SIPC. And now, it's time for the show that breaks down the options market. From unusual activity alerts to market analysis, strategy overviews, listener questions, and much more. If it involves puts and calls, then our all-star panel will break it down. It's time to hit the option block with your host, Mark Longo from the Options Insider Media Group and co-hosts Uncle Mike Tussaud from RCM Asset Management, Andrew the Rock Lobster Joe Venazzi from OptionPit.com, and Mark the Greasy Meatball Sebastian from OptionPit.com. And now, get ready to hit the Option Block. All right, everybody. That rocking tune means it's time to rock out yet again with everyone's favorite bi-weekly options show, The Option Block. My name is Mark Longo, coming at you live every Monday and Thursday, noon central, 1 p.m. Eastern, here via Mixler, M-I-X-L-R. That's where we can get it live right now. We're hoping to maybe expand those offerings in the new year, but right now Mixler is the place to get it live and the podcast and all the major outlets after the fact, if I sound a little bit under the weather, that's because I am, listeners. It's been a, uh, let's just say I got some, I came down with some quality contagion over the weekend, and I'm still still powering through. But we're still going to bring you a show today, so never you fear. It's like rain, nor sleet, nor wind, whatever the heck the, uh, the Postal Service pledge is there. We honor that here at the Option Block and at the Options Insider Radio Network. So you're going to get a show even if I may be a little bit subdued in the interim. Hopefully helping helping to lift me off my little nadir here. Uh, let's see who we got. Let's go out first to the quiet, tranquil land known as St. Charles, where I can always count on Uncle Mike to bring a ray of sunshine and optimism to the show. Uncle Mike, sir, uh, are you going to help me uh, to soldier on today, sir? Just call me Mr. Sunshine. Well, there you go. That, that's, that's a level of optimism I just cannot match today. So there you go, listeners. Uncle Mike, uh, bring in the optimism. And then I guess if we needed another dose of, uh, of dark gray, dubious cynicism, we go to the he heights of northern New England, where we are joined by the Rock Lobster himself, Mr. Andrew Giovinazzi from OptionPit.com. Mr. G, welcome back to the show. How goes your hard-won, hard-bitten New England cynicism today, sir? Hello! Uh, Hello! Oh, wait, we got... Uh, uh, we got a bait and switch. We got the meatball. Yeah, you got the meatball. You've been meatballed. <laughs> totally Take have. It. Totally have been meatballed. <laughs> I was expecting a nice dour uh, New Englander, and I got uh, the the happy greasy meatball, meatball from from the guy who uh, a town who changed America. Exactly. You know, while well, I'm actually at our world corporate headquarters in beautiful Chicago, Illinois, overlooking the financial capital of the deriv of the derivative world, LaSalle Street. Uh, and, uh, you know, it, it, speaking of getting meatballed, you know, it's a fun, you know, it's a fun thing to do is if you're having, uh, if your wife happens to like Prosecco and or champagne. Oh, nice. Excellent. Has Santa hat. Um, 
when you're having if she's having champagne and your kids are eating chicken nuggets, when she's not looking, take a chicken nugget and put it over the top of her champagne flute. And then when she goes, what is this, a chicken nugget? Be like, ha ha, you got nuggeted. It's the best. <laughs> that sounds like the quality humor I could expect from one of the towns uh, that changed America. All right, let's get rolling, listeners. <laughs> it's time to dive on into the trading block. It's time to break down the latest topics, trades, and trends in the world of options. It's time for The Trading Block. All right, listeners, another day, another sell-off, another market getting spooked by the broad, ma broad macro currents. But that worm does seem to be tur turning a little bit. Coming into the day, we saw a pretty uh, abrupt sell-off. Most of the major indices were off north of 1%, about 1.3, 1.4%, somewhere in that area. Now it seems like the worm is turning a little bit out there, maybe calmer, cooler, saner, more optimistic. Dare we say Uncle Mike heads are prevailing. NASDAQ actually green on the day right now, up about a tenth of a percent or so. The S&P only off about half a percent. Uh, the Dow only off about three quarters of a percent. So we're seeing those sell-offs pretty much cut in half, or in the case of the NASDAQ, actually turning green on the day I'm still seeing oil and gold off to the dark side a little bit today though crude after even after the big opec deal last week still can't manage to to find a bottom here Con continuing to to plumb new depths here on the downside and as all this still getting some downside we're seeing vix cash on the upswing today we got as high as let's see how high do we get about 25 65 appears to be the height of the day. That was about an hour or so ago. Today, we're well off those highs right now in the VIX land, only up about a handle or so, up to about 24 and a quarter or so. So looking, you know, if it continues, this is continue giving up this upside in VIX land, and it will look very good for our volatility views prognostications for the, uh, for the day to come. Looking at what's lighting it up out there right now, SPY and VIX are both uh, on the rampage. SPY doing about 2.71 million contracts coming into showtime. That's a little bit off of his ADV, which is a, an impressive 3.44 million contracts. VIX also just a tick under 300,000 contracts, 299,000 contracts on the tape coming into showtime. That was with an ADV of a little bit north of 600,000 contracts. And in terms of what was... What's lighting it up right now and the rest of the underlyings out there, getting away from the broad indices, looking at the equity options here. We got Apple leading the charge yet again, 591,000 contracts on the tape. Uh, the ADV still about 683,000. So ADV of Apple actually north of VIX, which is impressive. And we also have Bank of America, number two, about 500,000 contracts. Then we fall off a bit, number three, to GE with about 270,000 contracts. Number four, Facebook, 165,000. Number five, good old Ford, 136,000. Ford having some tough times. The whole auto industry having tough times of late. Uh, number six, AMD. Number seven, Amazon, both about 120, 130,000 contracts each. Uh, number eight, NVIDIA, 102,000. And round out the top 10, good old MU again. And BABA taking up the number 10 spot. Both of them a little bit shy of 100,000 contracts each. Uh, let's go abroad here. Let's go to the greasiest of meatballs first. Mr. Meatball, sir, in addition to uh, giving your wife surprise champagne nuggets, what's uh, what's catching your eye out there in today's activity, sir? Yeah, let's talk about Apple from down three buck, three and a half, four dollars to up on the day now. Um, that seems to be a what really changed market sentiment as a whole. Uh, the Nasdaq's now wildly green on the day. The S and P looks like it's about to go green. I wouldn't be shocked if if the Dow goes green. I'm not saying that what we have it in was a bottom, but it appears to be a near-dated bottom, at least for the time being, because uh, there is is some serious buying hitting the markets. Uh, the VIX now kind of adjusted for the weekend uh, is now uh, you know pretty much flat, and um, you know uh, kind of seeing some interesting buying across the board. I want to point out the SOX index which is the semiconductors, is way up. It's up uh, one and a quarter percent. That's where a lot of the NASDAQ strength is. Microsoft is up. Facebook is up. Google is up. Apple's now up. Really, uh, you know, the only real softness is, you know, Amazon's gotten itself to green. Maybe Netflix is. Netflix is up a little bit, too. So there seems to be some program buying stepping in and, and doing a lot of buying right here. Uh, I, I think from down 50 to flat on the day, 
if we get a bid here, now that the NASDAQ is green, I think it's going to pull everything green. Um, you know, kind of funny, kind of weird. Uh, but that is the way the market is setting itself up right now. Yeah, Apple hitting some lows today of around a 164 and change earlier in the session, starting to threaten. You know, we were talking about those 150 puts back in our poll a week or two ago, and those seem like a, like a distant strike. Now, this morning at least, not so much, only about 14 handles away. Then uh, the market deciding to turn the tables and just kind of getting back in rally ho mode, and all of a sudden, you're right, someone, someone hit the buy button on Apple and did so for size. Maybe the firm coming in. Scooping up, uh, scooping up some underlying here. Either way, driving it back down from about 164.86 all the way up to about 168.86. So literally four, exactly four handles in the span of, oh, about 20 minutes or so out there. So I'm going to go out on the limb and say maybe the firm was buying, but you never know. Those big swings, a lot of things could kick in. So obviously, some algos buy level was triggered there in Apple, and we were off to the races. Mr. Uncle Mike. A lot going on out here today. A lot for uh, the permable like you to maybe be happy about right now. What's what's catching your eye in this seems like uh, emerging ray of sunshine in the market today, sir? That's why you call me Mr. Sunshine. <laughs> so that way, and I'll do my you best not to get my meatballed. Sunshine, my only sunshine. You make me bullish when markets are gray. Oh, I You'll love it. You'll never know, dear, how much he loves stocks. Please don't take his sunshine away. Not bad. Not bad for an now, improv, sir. Now, Thank now, you, now you know it's going to be a, Now you know it's going to be a highly rated show, and you can say in the show notes, the meatball serenades Uncle Mike. You, how can someone not <laughs> want to hear that, see that, or listen to that? So Interestingly, we're having meatballs for lunch today, too. Holy cow, this is just so crazy. <laughs> they're wow. turkey now today they're turkey meatballs, so they're not greasy. Uh, although I did fold some um, some uh, low fat uh, ricotta cheese into the meatballs this time. So they're extra delicate. Ooh, sounds good. Sounds Something like good. a delicate meatball. <laughs> For sure. Well, I think overall in, in what's going on with this market, yeah, with like what Mark said, someone hit the buy button on Apple. And that's one of the things that's really driving this market, no doubt about it. Uh, but the other thing I just want to keep saying, keep mentioning is that macro is macro geopolitical risk is what has brought down this market in this most recent sell off. And that's what's going to bring it back uh, when I believe that magically we're going to get some type of deal at some point. Will it be tomorrow? Will it be two months from now? Who knows? Uh, but I think right now it's still a tremendous opportunity to be buying some out of the money call spreads, not calls, but call spreads. Typically, I mean, every stock's different, but call spreads. Uh, if you want to become bullish, it's a way with which you can just take a smaller amount of money, invest it in the marketplace. And if you're dead wrong and I'm dead wrong and uh, all of a sudden the S and P goes down to 1800, well, all you lost was the, the money you put in for the call spreads. But uh, if it does go higher uh, it can be very beneficial to you, whether you're doing an out-of-the-money bullish butterfly, an out-of-the-money vertical. Every situation is different, and everyone's needs and goals are different. But I think we do have a tremendous buying opportunity if that's what you're looking to do. Uh, I think that um, if you're trying to uh, sell premium in this market, unless you're non-levered and you're trying to do like a wheel trade, that's one thing. But if you're trying to sell put spreads or something along those lines, I think uh, just to steal a line from the, the the greasy meatball when he was referencing Tesla a couple of weeks ago, uh, that's for crazy people. And crazy people typically don't end up profitable. Uh, so I think right now, if you're a bull, it's a phenomenal buying opportunity if you manage risk in the right way. Um, some other things that are that are happening along with oil. Uh, when oil had that rally last week, uh, up, I believe, 4% on the day, something along those lines. Uh, it's still not, uh, it's coming down a little bit today, but that's another thing to keep an eye on with what's happening with OPEC. But once again, uh, this is a lot of geopolitical risk. And if just an inkling of good news comes out, this is going to shift in a heartbeat. We're not getting companies that are losing money. It's not like 2008 when there was a lot of really bad fundamentals and bad things happening along those lines. I mean, there's still bad things, of course, but uh, companies are still making money. And when companies make money, typically stocks do well. But let's remember the old cliche, the market can remain irrational longer than you can remain solvent. Protect your risk. 
Yeah, speaking of irrational things, that part, part of what spooked uh, the market today were some uh, some reps, you clean the U.S. trade rep going on the the weekly talk shows on Sunday and kind of outlining the fact that there was a hard, quote unquote, hard deadline of 90 days in that in those trade talks between us and China out there till March 1st. And I think reiterating that kind of hard line always always spooks the market. We also have, of course, uh, Brexit looming uh, vote coming up, I believe, on Tuesday over there in Britain as to whether they're going to affirm this going forward. Going to be some changes over there. Miss May may have her uh, her political future in the air over there as a result as well. So a lot of things kind of weighing on the market today, but apparently, even though, of course, the, the China lodging, a, what they term a strong protest, which in diplomatic terms is is a pretty pretty vigorous uh, <laughs> over the arrest of the, uh, the CFO of Huawei over there. So a lot of things are combining to spook the market, but today, uh, at least so far, uh, Apple, of course, the Apple was a uh, Chinese court was banning the sale of a bunch of iPhones. That was, of course, what was really weighing on Apple. Maybe someone decided those fares are overblown. Either way, they bought a bunch of it <laughs> going in to uh, this big move. As you've seen, this big four-handle swing here in just a few minutes in Apple, which is impressive for such a big and widely trained name. Obviously, pretty aggressive on the bid there. Uh, speaking of aggressive volume, let's get on. We didn't get a chance to break down these numbers last week, so let's do it now. Our friends over there at the OCC, a.k.a. the Options Clearing Corp., uh, coming out with their numbers for November. And surprise, surprise, all this trade back and forth, the midterms, everything else that was driving vol also drove some pretty impressive numbers out there in options land. <coughs> Excuse me. November volume was up almost 10.5% from 2017. So that's uh, pretty strong numbers. Uh, let's. We also had their uh, cleared contract record. They blew through it in November. Year to date, 4.71 billion options contracts uh, and 4.8 billion total uh, contracts. Remember, they clear other things like futures and stuff. Uh, with both reaching new annual cleared contract volume records, the previous records, it shows shows what kind of a plateau the options business has been in for the better part of the last half decade or so. The last time records were set were back in 2011 with 4.56 billion options contracts, 4.56 billion option contracts. 4.6 to billion total contracts being cleared at OCC. So OCC blowing through those in November. So clearly we're going to have a record year. Everyone, I know Henry Schwartz and others have been beating that drum. Looks like we're going to see a 5 billion contract year. He's been firmly on that prediction since earlier in the year. So I got to take my hat off to him because it does seem like we are on course for that. He tweeted this last week uh, with 17 and a half trading days remaining. Looks like he said uh, OCC volume firmly on course for 5 billion contracts in 2018. Days like today, Certainly with 3 million contracts going up and SPY alone, certainly looking to uh, to lift that. Let's dig a little bit further into where we like to play, which is, of course, the listed options side. A listed options volume, 429 million contracts in November. That's up 11.3% from November of 2017. Equity options volume, 383.8 million contracts. That's up nearly 13% from November of last year. Cleared ETF options, that's 179 million. That's up 32.7%, huge increase, excuse me, from November of last year. Drilling down a little bit further, index options volume up a mere 0.8% uh, with 45.8 million contracts. That's year to year. That's so up slightly from this time last year. And we mentioned this before on Volviews, the futures is kind of one of the few dark spots there. Futures cleared uh, 8.3 million contracts, down 23.2%. Remember the lion's share of that is going to be VIX futures. There's some Bitcoin and other stuff thrown in there as well. I'll have to get the exact breakdown from OCC and how much volume the Bitcoin is. But still, overall, it's uh, lion's share is going to be VIX futures. And as we said before, uh, not a huge amount of action there, down 23% from this time last year. Still feeling the weight of the death of XIV and its ilk out there. I don't know, Mr. Meatball, Mr. Uncle Mike, those numbers are surprising you? And you got, are you guys buying what the Schwartz, uh, the Schwartzatron, aka the Flowmaster, is selling? You think we're going to be on track for five billion? Excuse me, five, yeah, five billion contracts this year? Wow, I don't argue with the Flowmaster. That's uh, that's serious, and I think that's a really good sign for option markets as a whole. Um, maybe we're finally starting to get through some of this uh, fragmenting. Uh, you know, uh, where uh, my question would be of that, maybe the flow mask can answer this of that. How much is actually, uh, are all these extra exchanges that are allegedly add value that probably don't, uh, at uh, how much of that volume are, are they, are they bringing in? 
That would be my my big question. My guess is that the majority of that that amazing flow is straight out of um, uh, straight out of uh, straight out of uh, out of the the big the big four. Well, I can answer some big of that five. for you. Uh, OCC does break down market share numbers as well. I happen to have those here. By exchange, we can do a little quick depth uh, plunge into that. Look at numbers here for total. It says total options for 2018 and 20. So I'm not sure if this is total. Total. This is just for November, which is usually what they break down, or if this is actually their percentage of total volume uh, for 2018. Either way, I think those numbers percentages will probably still be in line here. Uh, we're seeing Box Boston Options Exchange a little bit shy of two percent. One and three quarters percent. That's pretty much exact same level as they were at 2017. SIBO uh, by itself, a little bit shy at 25 percent. It was 26 and a half percent in 2017. But if you add in all the other things that it bought, bats, and it has C2 and the edge X from bats too, it gets up to 37.74 percent. Uh, still down from 40 and a quarter percent last year. So you see the C. It's kind of hard to delineate individual exchanges now, listeners, because it's really all about exchange groups, and that's kind of what we're seeing. The SIBO Exchange Group. Is doing about 37 and three quarter. Again, they bought some volume when they acquired bats. Uh, Myax not doing bad numbers here, actually. Myax itself, three and a half percent. That's a little bit less than it was last year, but it's pretty close. And Myax Pearl, actually, which is their new addition, actually doing nearly five percent, 4.71 percent, up from one and a half percent last year. So Myax to combine two entities, accounting for about eight and a quarter percent of, of volume here in 2018, which is uh, impressive. Uh, to say the least here. Obviously, people liking the uh, the speed advantage and maybe some of the fee ARB and rebates going on over there on MyAx Pearl. Those folks were in the studio not that long ago for FIA. You can check out my conversation I had with them uh, very recently here on the old network. Look for our interview show there. Uh, now, now you get to the, the you know the behemoths. You get to NASDAQ. And NASDAQ by itself, NASDAQ options market doing about 8.5%, 8.35%. Then you add in about 7.7% for, for ISE. Gemini, which is a spinoff of ISE, about 3.6%. Uh, MRX, which I forgot is one of those ones they create, I think, just to keep a license active. That does nothing, a tenth of a percent. Uh, Nobo, <laughs> NASDAQ options book, whatever the hell that one is, the other quarter of a percent there. And then our old friend, the Philly, uh, 14%. So what you have there really are three exchanges, Philly, ISC, Gem4, and NASDAQ really holding down the lion's share. The other two kind of just extraneous licenses they're keeping active. 34.1% from them off about... Oh, about 3% from this time last year. And then uh, NYSE, so pretty much ARCA and Amex. Uh, ARCA doing about 9.35%. Amex doing about 8.375%, so total about 18.12% for those two. So that's how it breaks down, listeners, uh, in terms of exchange group. My ex carbon out a much, much bigger share for itself than I would have uh, I would have assumed. So interesting stuff going on there. Meanwhile, we got to keep on rolling with some more interesting stuff. It is time to head on into the odd block. It's time to break down the most interesting, unusual, and downright questionable options activity that's been identified by TheOptionsInsider.com. It's time for The Odd Block. Welcome to the Odd Block. As my voice, my voice is holding up here, listener. So that's a that's a good sign, uh, Mr. Meatball. Before we get into the Odd Block thing, this sounds like you think uh, the MyAx numbers are mostly driven by by fee arb versus uh, low latency and those types of things. Yes, um, you know I'm I'm interested in you know listening to that volume. I think uh, I was interested that SIBO saw the big drop, and I think that's got to be directly related to the VIX contract, uh, kind of getting punched in the face uh, at the beginning of the year. Uh, I am surprised by that Miami stock exchange stuff. I think it's mostly BR that they're doing well on, but you know, if, 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 you know, and it helps that, you know, some of these arrangements where the groups that broker are also own the exchange are kind of interesting. And that I know has been a direct component to uh, Miami having some, some, a nice pop. Um, I didn't realize the Philly had lost that much vol volume. Yeah, once, once, once the kind of uh, once the div trades went away, right? There, there's not as much uh, not as much need for the Philly. They're still doing a decent amount, but uh, all that their lion share that of their used business to be their for, big thing, right? They yeah, the lion share of their volume a, for years was a just a million uh, billion exactly. billion div plays, and then they went away. 
So yeah, you go figure. You got million trade, million plus traded contract a day trades going away. It's going to impact. It's going to impact your overall volume numbers. But you're right. Interesting story there on my ax. I'm looking forward to seeing what they get going with uh, with the with their new uh, VIX competitor. Uh, we'll see if they can get that uh, ball rolling over there. Meanwhile, let's start the ball rolling in the odd block. Uh, let's see Tesla, our old friend Tesla. We like to talk about them every now and then. Tesla today feeling a little bit of the love, up about nearly two handles right now, hovering a little bit shy, right, right at the 360 level, a little bit shy of How low did it get intraday here? Got down to 353.29. So this is a serious swing in Tesla land here, too, over six handles here in just the span of about, oh, let's, yeah, about an hour change, maybe a little more, a couple hours, actually. Uh, so, yeah, so another one, people side in prayer, perhaps they're, we're hitting the bottom, hitting the buy button here in Tesla land. Doesn't mean our old friends, the crazy town puts, aren't lighting it up. Uh, we see a big, the big, in fact, the big, one of the big trades in Tesla today, the Jan 50 puts going up for three cents a thousand times yet again. And then another one blocked for 975. So thousands of them trading today. Let's see if I can get uh, a little bit of the total on there. For some reason, never wants to play ball with me when I hit that button. Let me try this button. <coughs> It is not wanting to play ball with me here. So I can't get the totals right now for how much volume is going up here on Tesla. But let's, let's just say it's a lot. Also, they're seeing the Jan 40 puts going up. Jan 45 puts. Big blocks of 500 East. Multiple 500, 500. Jan 50 puts for four cents. Getting bid up a little bit from two cents up to four cents today. So a lot of action here, listeners. Tons of action here in these downside Tesla land puts. Decent sized blocks going up. 1,000, 1,000, 500, 500, 400, 400. So clearly... Uh, some action in these, a lot of these lifting offers, so uh, perhaps closing, but you never know. There's a, still a ton of OI here on these bad boys, even if my system does not want to play ball with me to allow me to see <laughs> exactly what it is. Let's see. Let's move on here to some names. What did our eye of Sauron pick up on today? Let's see. We're going to kick things off. That's one of the fun things about doing these live listeners is that you never know what the hell we're going to talk about, which is kind of fun. And we're going to kick things off. This is Tanger Factory Outlet Centers, Inc., ticker symbol SKT, skit. This is definitely a newcomer here to the odd block. Trading today, $23.42, off about a buck or nearly 4%. And let's see, what did we see out here that caught our eye? We saw, looks like some put love here. In particular, it was the March 22 half, so slightly out of the money, a little bit longer term, about three months or so, uh, puts here going up 6,486 times for a buck 10, pretty much right below the offer there, a nickel away from the offer. Does seem like this is uh, probably biased to buy in paper. Don't see any big block of stock going up with it. Opening, so not much OI to speak of here. So this, this one looks like here, our first baby here on the old odd block does appear to be Looks like some equity buying, equity hedging, I should say, with the put side going out only three months, which is kind of interesting. Usually go up a little bit longer, but three months is usually kind of the baseline I would consider for when they're looking into lock in a little bit of a hedge. Uh, this thing over the past year, let's see, a year ago it was trading about 25 bucks. So a couple of handles north of where it is right now. Got as high as, oh, 26 and a half back in December of last year. That was kind of the heights for this one. Then it kind of turned on its ear. And back towards the summer of last year, got down to about 20. So it's had about a six-handle range over the course of the year, rally back up to 24 and a half back in August, and then sold off again. So it's kind of been vacillating around in this six or so handle range. For the better part of the last year, these 22 half puts for a buck puts them again, of course, at 2140 out there, which would be pretty much firmly at the bottom end of this six handle range. Mr. Meatball, what are you thinking about these? Are you liking these uh, puts? you think this is equity hedging here in Tangier Factory Outlet Centers, Inc.? As one of the largest holders of Tangier Factory Holdings, Inc., um, I can tell you exactly what we were doing. We were hedging our stock, and so that's why we were executing that trade. There you go, in case you can't tell. That's, that's not true, guys. <laughs> I, in case I don't you, own. In case you can't tell. As much as I love that company i currently have no position but it's got to be a stock hedge that's that's the only reason why anybody would do that trade yeah it doesn't have that feel to it let's go along let's see what else we got lighting up our eye of sauron here today we got uh 
Another newcomer to the odd block. This is HD Supply Holdings Inc. Ticker symbol HDS. Closing, or should say trading right now. Pretty much unched. $37.82. Off slightly, but not a ton here. Uh, this is, let's see. Well, we'll get to that chart in a second. But let's look out here. What was catching our eye? Also puts a little bit closer to home this time. We got the Jan 35 puts going up for... 67 and a half cents in this case they're kind of right off the bid a couple cents off the bid it was 65 cents bid at 80 when this trade went up so right off the bid also opening not a lot of oi to speak of here so it could be 3500 times could be a little bit of there's a rock lobster would like to say a little bit of the old line in the sand puts drawn a nice little line looking to buy themselves a little bit of hds should it drop down let's see Let's look at how it's feared over the past year, see if that strike is even relevant. Let's see. A year ago, it was trading about $39, and so a couple, about a buck and change higher than where it is right now. Got as low as, oh, it looks like it flirted with the low 36 handle, 36.06 back in February, which we all know February, a bit of a tumultuous period. Got as high as nearly 46 again back in August. So like a lot of these names that had a nice peak in August and kind of turned around aggressively again. Got kept it back down to 36 again, so it's had a, about a 10-handle range or close to it in the better part of the last few months here. Uh, so this one, maybe someone deciding, you know, um, uh, th that that level is not bad. It's below the 52-week low, which is actually, you know, it's right at it, 34.49. So it would kind of pretty much, those puts would clearly come into play at that point. Uh, what do you think, Mr. Meatball? I think this is someone drawing the proverbial line in the sand, wanting to buy themselves some HDS or HD. HDS around uh, thirty five bucks, or you got something else you think brewing? Uh, you know, it, it, it either that or it's somebody trying to collect a bunch of premium that's willing to take delivery. Um, it it definitely looks like the you know I will buy the stock for thirty five bucks, and I like selling the the premio. That's a nice that's a big sale. Um, now this is uh, you know this is a, a spinoff of Home Depot. So it does have a limited holding. So we could probably, if we sat down, maybe figure out who that was. Might be fun. There you go. Maybe I'll, uh, I'll let you do a little digging while we get into our final, uh, final name, our final victim here. Yeah, so nice. They're harvesting not quite a quarter million, but close to it if all that comes to pass. And if not, they're buying themselves a good chunk of HDS stock. Let's round it off. Another H name. Another newcomer to the odd block. Uh, this time we got HYGS. This is Hydrogenics Corporation. Uh, this is our resident cheapy. <coughs> excuse me, on the day about four dollars and fifty cents. Another one's kind of unched off about a nickel or so. Uh, this one looks like our eye of Sauron picking up again. This is kind of a low volume name here. So someone doing twenty five hundred out here is a pretty big trade. We're seeing twenty five hundred of the May fives going up for. 55 cents, a nice double print here on the five calls. Again, opening, not a lot of OI to speak of in this name here as we're hovering at four and a half bucks. So someone paying 55 cents to get some exposure out to the five strike through May of next year, 2,500 times. Good thing the Viceroy is not here. I don't think he would approve of such a trade. He's not a big fan of trading options on sub $5 names. A year ago, though, it was not sub $5. It was north of 10. It was about 11 bucks a year ago. Got as high as, let's see, 11.55, pretty much about end of December of last year. So that was kind of the height for this name ever since then. It's kind of been slowly on the downside. By the way, if you're wondering, this is a developer and manufacturer of hydrogen generation and fuel cell products. So we all know uh, the fuel cell market has kind of been ebbing and flowing for decades now. Every few years, you see a new breakthrough out there. Oh, it's going to make it's going to make hydrogen fuel cells, uh, you know, the the better, much better than electric cars. And then they kind of something falls apart, or they can't get funding, or you just can't get the hydrogen infrastructure out there. Either way, all that stuff kind of combining to to weigh on the industry, and clearly weighing here on hydrogenics as well. The whole year has kind of been pretty much one long slide to the dark side. Let's see, getting us right now, we're at pretty much a 52 week low at. Four dollars and thirty-eight cents, or close to it here. So, not exactly, uh, not exactly a big, strong, bullish trend here for HYGS, Mr. Meatball. But someone seems like they're feeling a little bit of love here. 
a goblin up 2,500 of the five calls, thinking we're going to turn this bad boy around. What do you think? You like this one, or are you, you, are you a, more of a fan of uh, having the stock at this point when it's $4.49? It, it's a shot. It's an inexpensive way of getting leverage. $4, that's about as low as I go before I start asking why, right? Uh, anywhere below, you know, I would not on calls worth two bucks, uh, nor would I, but you know, it's right there. I, I, I don't know that I, I would probably just stick to the stock, but, uh, you know, I, I'm not going to bash them for, for going after this one yet any cheaper. And, and then, then they go to my penalty box. <laughs> so they're close, close, but not quite in the meatball penalty box speaking of penalty box let's see what uh, uncle mike's got in store for us maybe he's got a stock in the penalty box maybe he's got some sweet option strategies he wants to put in the penalty well, we never know we, we have to go to find out so let's keep on rolling right on into the strategy block it's time to dispense options wit wisdom and education it's time for the strategy block all right, my Uncle Mike, this is the portion of the show that I have been waiting for with bated breath because it means I don't have to talk for a little bit, which is quite nice. Uh, so, Uncle Mike, sir, what do you have in store for us on today's bit of strategy, sir? I was just thinking we'd take a break from the strategy block and make it the long go block because I wanted to give it over to you today. How very generous of you, sir. <laughs> just kidding, just kidding. I want to talk about about uh, what can be your greatest friend and your greatest enemy at times, uh, and that's a certain position. It's a position that we all need to be very aware of as traders and investors, uh, and that position is cash. Let's talk about that for a second. So what about cash? Now, first off, what do I mean by cash? Well, that's when you're invested into, say, uh, perhaps uh, some type of government treasury bond, a savings account, a money market account, or just being in cash in your brokerage account, whatever the case may be, cash is cash. And I want to go through times that I think it's a very wise place to be. Uh, the first time, uh, probably I can't even tell you how many times that cash has saved me and has kept me in the game as a trader, as an investor, as a financial advisor, because I was not afraid to go to it. Uh, let's go through the psychology of trading as well as investing. If God were to tell you that the market were to go down, and let's assume that you're just a bull here, you're not going to do anything bearish. Uh, you could, but if you want to, just reverse what I'm about to say with this. Uh, let's assume that you want to be bullish, and God were to tell you the market were to go down, well, you'd be in cash. There'd be no qualms about it. You would be in cash or some bond fund or something besides stocks. And with that being said, it's a wonderful place to be because you know you're not going to lose because God told you the market's going to go down. Now, unfortunately, God doesn't tell people where the market's going to go. Trust me, I've asked. Um, so when can cash be a very viable position? Well, I think it's very important to be there when you don't feel confident in where you're going to put your money. Let's say that maybe you've had a bad run of trades or maybe you wanted to sell a put spread on this dip recently and you've gotten your face ripped in a little bit. Or let's say that uh, maybe the market's gone up so much you just can't handle getting into the market right now because it's so high. There is nothing wrong with being in cash. What if, Mike, though, the market goes higher and I miss out on it? I, I can't handle missing out on it. Well, let me tell you something. I've made good phone calls and bad phone calls and neutral phone calls to clients for many, many years now. I've made calls saying, hey, we lost a little bit, uh, calls saying, hey, we've made a ton of money, and calls saying, well, we've been in cash. And I can tell you right now, the calls that are, hey, we've been in cash, when the market's gone higher, they're not easy by any means. But the calls that say, hey, we've lost money, those are very difficult. That's a very hard pill to swallow. And that's a very harsh reality of life. Now, is losing a part of trading at times? Absolutely. Anyone who denies that just simply hasn't traded before, hasn't invested anything. But is missing out on upside when you're in cash part of trading? Absolutely. My message for today is that missing out on the opportunity of a lifetime is a far, far, far better thing to experience than losing money. So with that being said, 
have an understanding that there's going to be times when you lose money. There's going to be times when you make money. And there's going to be times when you miss out on the upside because you are in cash, as well as miss out on the downside because you're in cash. Cash is something that oftentimes isn't talked about in the trading world because everyone just assumes that you always are trading. There is no law anywhere that says that you have to trade. There's no, uh, there's no rules with your brokerage account saying that you have to trade. Now, some of them do have minimum activity requirements, but I tend to avoid places like that. But the point is, is that never be feel that you're obligated to be in something. If you want to be in cash for a while, there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, there's good things. One thing the Rock Lobster often says is that when he goes on vacation, he's in cash. He doesn't want to think about markets for a while. The market's going to be there when you get back. So with that being said, I want to emphasize how viable and how important it is to have cash as a regular position at times throughout your trading career. There's times that I've gone months at a time with just being in cash. Sometimes clients call and say, hey, how come my money's not working? And I'll call them back and say, because if, if I was working the money the way I wanted to, then you'd be losing money right now. And of course, the client isn't by all means happy when he hears that, but I have long enough relationships with clients or I've had where I, I have a lot of very longstanding relationships with clients to where they understand if we're in cash for a couple months, uh, then we'll be okay. Uh, but if you're losing money consistently, it's not something to where it makes sense to get into a market just because you feel you have to have your money working. It's much better to not lose than to have your money working when it's going to be working to go down. And that is the strategy block for today. Well done, sir. Let's keep on rolling, see what we can get from you guys here on the old show. It is time to open up the mail block. It's time to take your seat on the all-star panel as we read your emails, tweets, Facebook messages, website comments, and much more. It's time for the mail block. All right, everybody. Welcome to the Mail Block, the portion of the show. You guys ask us questions. We turn the tables on you, ask you guys questions. It's a whole palooza here. It's a whole thing we do. And this week, uh, you guys loved our Apple question of the week from last time, so we threw another one out there for you to get you guys sink your teeth into. It's always fun, kind of use-your-gut type of questions. No cheating. Be relying on the honor system here. Uh, we're saying, you know, everyone loves trading Apple, so uh, the open interest always huge. But a few interesting positions tend to dominate that chart right now. So right now, what do you think? is the largest open position in Apple options. No cheating. Try to use that spidey sense. Gave you four choices. We narrowed it down. Look how nice we are. We narrowed down the whole universe for you to four choices. Gave you the Jan 2020 200 calls, the Jan 250, regular Jan 250 calls, uh, Dece 180 put, <coughs> excuse me, or the Jan par put. Again, regular Jan 100 Put as I mentioned earlier, Apple on the upswing up to about one six over one sixty nine now one sixty nine ten. So maybe that'll factor into your decision. Let's go to the meatball first, Mister Meatball. What is your pick, and more importantly, what do you think our audience is picking of those four, sir? I'm gonna say they're going for the two hundreds. The Jan twenty twenty two hundreds. Interesting, interesting, Mister Mister Uncle Mike, our resident Apple guy here. Uh, what's your pick, sir? One eighty puts. Open and short interest on them. Interesting. Interesting choices. Right now, our audience is kind of feeling both of those. Uh, again, this just went live right before the show, so it'll probably evolve over the course of the week. But so far in the early voting here, uh, the Jan 2020 200 calls are leading the storm with about 39% followed hot and heavy by the Dece 180 puts with 30%. And then the Jan two half calls, 17%. And no one loving the Jan par puts, only 14%. For those bad boys, that'll run through the rest of the week. So get on over there to at options if you have not already and make your boy. I know the answer. I'm staring at it right now. I shall not reveal it so that we can have some fun for the rest of the week. But we'll keep the answer on lockdown. And later in this week, maybe end of the week, we shall reveal it for you guys out there. But right now, the 2020 200 call lead in the dance. Let's see. Hmm, we got some. 
questions. Let's see. RTS3 has got a question for me. Of course he does. The day I can't speak, he's got a question for me. He says, Mark, Mark said he used to trade Activision a lot. <coughs> Excuse me. Outside of trading it, do you also play their games? If so, what's on your black your playlist these days? Also, the Rock Lobster is a cool nickname. Is it from the B-52s? Uh, yeah, I may have borrowed it from them. But you're right, it is a cool nickname. And I take full credit for coming up with that, as I am the dispenser of all nicknames here on the show. But yeah, I may have borrowed it from a uh, from a line or two from the old P-52s. Uh, what do I do? I What does Elsie wants to know? Do I play Activision game? What is a specific? I guess Call of Duty would be an Activision game. And uh, I don't, uh, I am not currently playing any Call of Duty. I used to back in the day. I haven't picked it up. I did, I did, that said, you know, this is the time of year all those deals are on so I probably picked it up and it's probably waiting in my pile to try out later this year but right now I'm not I'm not uh, I'm not rocking any Activision of the Activision divisions I'm much more been a Blizzard guy over the years I liked all the old all the old Blizzard stuff not, not so much on the WoW front but on all the Starcraft and everything so those were fun but I haven't really played any of those hasn't been a new one of those in a while either so uh, not a lot really on the Activision front and I don't really trade it a lot either so not a lot really going on on the uh, once it broke out of that range, like I said, it used to be one of the more reliable premium sales in the business. Right now, it's way north of that range. It used to be have a nice, let's say, I want to say, eleven handle to like twenty handle range. And when it was vacillating within that, you could do a lot of fun things in that range. These days, not so much. Right now, Activision hovering at forty six eighty six. Uh, got as high this year, <coughs> excuse me, as about eighty three. Wow. Uh, back in October, so it's been a rough few months here uh, for Activision. Clearly, not not feeling the love out there. I know some of the, uh, I think some of that loot box controversy kind of weighing on them, and a few other things. Clearly, combining for a one daunting Call of Duty, Black Ops has is perhaps uh, performing as expected. So a lot of things combining there uh, to weigh on that. So huh, maybe we're going to get back to retracing those ranges sometime soon. But for now, no. And I think the Rock Lobster likes his gaming trading as well, but I don't think he's been. He's been active in any of those as well. Uh, we got Austin41 in the chat. He liked your story, Mark. He says, you've been nuggeted. So I, b- I believe you uh, you shared even a video of you nuggeting your wife. Is that correct, sir? Yes, that is the the proper nuggeting form uh, that I put out there. That was uh, the original nuggeting. Uh, you know, I was looking. They, you know what? Uh, Blizzard is World of Warcraft and Overwatch. Yes. Um, those are not bad games. Uh, Activision has Crash Bandicoot and call of duty i like call of duty but uh you know right now they you know just i don't see a lot um you know the, the games that are, are cleaning up this week uh, are smash brothers and um and uh you know you still have everybody playing uh fortnite right that's that's the other one i mean i a friend of mine was telling me that her kid was having problems at school and uh she took away uh took away Fortnite and the the kid was crying so that's the only video game that i've ever heard of that uh bringing that kind of a reaction to i can tell you that like never in my time when i had uh you know super mario brothers 3 did i ever cry when my parents said no nintendo uh but uh, yeah. that that's how addicting some of these new games Fortnite are. is uh Fortnite is, you're right. is nuts it is dominating the pack if you have a young kid in the 10 and under category uh or 10 or even 10 and above uh yeah it's uh Fortnite is the thing so uh, yeah and that's a free game so how is uh you know that's certainly going to hurt a game like call of duty which is a 60 dollar game and the fact they're ripping it off they're doing their own battle royale mode just like uh just like Fortnite is so you got a free one and you got a $60 one i guess go figure i'm looking at the numbers here now for what activision uh, reported their earnings came back uh, a few weeks ago here they reported 1 and a half 1.5 billion dollars in revenues down from the previous year uh, their their guidance for the fourth quarter also fell short of expectations and that's really seems like uh what hit the stock the stock was up 20% through September. So year to date, it was a good year for Activision through September. But uh, that was when things started to turn for them. Uh, Call of Duty 4 Black Ops, yeah, they said that was released on October 12th. Didn't even hit last year's sales numbers for Call of Duty. And uh, that uh, that uh, hurt it. And they mentioned Fortnite here, too. They say Fortnite's free. So that's eroding their numbers here. So, yeah, and also they, they had their big BlizzCon event and one of their staples like Diablo. The fans not not too happy about that either. So when you're hardcore is not liking what you're putting out there and then and they're not buying your products like a, like a Call of Duty when there's free alternatives out there, go figure. That one two punch 
is weighing on the stock and has gone from being up 20% on the year and now at least from those highs off nearly 50%. So rough run here for Activision. Maybe worth trading and then taking another look at. Interesting stuff. Good question here from RTS3. All right, we got to keep on rolling into our final segment. It is time to go around the block. It's time to tell you what we'll be watching on our trading screens until the next episode. It's time for Around the Block. Look in here. This is just some stunning numbers. They generate $4 billion annually from sales of in-game content, which are like those loot boxes and those kind of things. That's a stunning amount of money from add-ons to what are mostly already $60 games. So as controversial as those things may be, they clearly make some money for them. $4 billion annually from in-game content. That is a ton of money from uh, loot boxes and blind, all sorts of other nonsense and those things. So still some interesting nuggets to be mined there in good old ATV. All right, going around now, we're talking here. This is uh, Around the Block, where we look ahead. And as you mentioned at the top of the show, there's some weird kind of macro trends. Uh, this weird wind's afoot right now, and it's kind of blowing the market hither and yon, and no one... No sane person can really make sense of it because it's not really sane right now. There's all sorts of weird wins. NASDAQ firmly in the green as we're wrapping up the show here, up about half a percent. Uh, the S&P, again, not only having trimmed its losses, <coughs> but getting close to being in the green itself, about down about a tenth of a percent, a little more, about 0.14%. And we're seeing the Dow off about a quarter of a percent. So a huge turnaround here in the markets. Again, we're talking here on the show. The market turns around. Correlation, causation, you guys be the judge. Meanwhile, Uncle Mike, you're a perma bull. You got to be smiling right now. What are you watching the rest of the week, sir? Mm -hmm. Just watching to see if we have any more announcements about uh, the trade deal or just think everything macro at this stage. Macro as well as the numbers to see if uh, we hold at these levels. Uh, that's about it. Uh, all right. And Mr. Uh, Mr. Meatball, non-greasy, he said, I think tasty with a little bit of regatta today. Mr. Meatball, what are you watching for the rest of the week, sir? You know, I'm really interested in kind of what happens with Brexit today. I don't think it's a huge deal, but I'm going to be watching it. Um, I, I, I want to see what Apple does. As, as Apple price action goes, so goes the market. If Apple gets a bid under it and some people decide to buy it, uh, that thing is the market's going to go straight up. Uh, and I'm also looking at oil. That's the if you want to know why we're still why the Dow is still down despite the Nasdaq being up uh, seven tenths of a percent, it's because oil uh, is getting smacked in the face xle is off almost two percent xlf is almost one and a half percent down everything else is up so uh you know just what's gonna happen with the financials what's gonna happen with uh those other ones and that's what i'm watching those other ones indeed unfortunately that music means we come to the end listeners i survived i did it i survived the show hopefully later this week i'll have uh, all my wits about me again here to hold down the big cheer but we did it for now like you mentioned uh xle and some of the crew is still off a handle or so and change out there in wti land kind of interesting i've always said before on the show here that you know we're all naked short oil so as an economy so sell-offs and crude should be beneficial, but then again, you know, they get too low, they damage some other companies out there. So we're in this that weird zone right now, that weird dance there between uh, being helpful to the broad economy, but also hurtful to some names out there in these big indices like the Dow. Uh, so interesting stuff out there. We'll keep an eye on it. More content coming to you on the network this week. Stay tuned for it. But before we go, let me go back around the horn. Let's start with uh, ye old Uncle Mike, sir. If I'm intrigued by what you're talking about, maybe I want someone to roll some puts for me. Maybe I just want to click on the fox. Where should I go? What should I do? By all means, go to my website, thinkstarswealth.com. If you want a financial advisor who is not afraid of rolling puts and doing such things and uh, using these wonderful things that we call options, give me a call. Check out my website, thinkstarswealth.com. They are indeed wonderful things. You too should use them. If you're listening to this show, you probably are. So welcome. If not, uh, dip your toes in. The waters are fine out there. All right. And Mr. Meatball, if I want to learn about how I, myself, I too, could dip my toes in the proverbial options waters, or maybe I want to check out a fund that will help me do just that. Where should I go? What should I do, sir? Well, if you're interested in learning how to actively trade options, go to optionpit.com, and I'm happy to work with you. Uh, if you want a passive investment uh, in the form of a fund that is a smarter way of trading the S&P and you're an accredited investor, uh, reach out to me, mark at CarmenLineCapital.com. 
All right, listeners, check it out. Optionpit.com or Carmen Lines. Carmen with the K. Carmen Line Capital.com to learn more about what he's got going on there. And on behalf of the Meatball and Uncle Mike and indeed myself, I want to thank you all for downloading, streaming, subscribing, all the fun stuff that you guys do. Keep it coming, commenting in our chat, sending in questions, voting in our polls. We appreciate all of it. And we'll see you back here soon. And for this show in particular, we'll see you back on Thursday for more of the Option Block. The preceding program was a production of the Options Insider Radio Network. For more quality options programs, visit www.theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app, available in iTunes and on Google Play. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at twitter.com slash options, facebook.com slash the Options Insider, or via questions at theoptionsinsider.com. 